Hey guys, I'm sitting here in my tomato patch because it's Tomato Tuesday. And so as you can see, I've got a really good amount of tomatoes coming on here. I've even got some that are coloring up. And so I've got my rat traps out because I'm protecting these fruit because they could be ripe any day. And you know, rat traps always make the garden more beautiful. But I am excited that I'm gonna have a nice flavorful heirloom tomato on my plate probably within the week. It's exciting. All right, let's get going on this list. And today I'm gonna to be going over 10 tomato growing mistakes that you might be making. And we're gonna get you to stop making those mistakes so you can have a huge harvest over the next couple of months. Coming up. I'm Brian with California Garden TV. And if you're looking to join an online garden community that offers tips, tricks, and support, to grow your best garden ever, especially tomatoes, then you're in the right place. Get started now by clicking subscribe and hit the bell so you never miss anything. Now let's get growing. So getting right into it, um, the first mistake on the list is not knowing the type of tomato that you're growing. So that could mean a couple of different things. First off, when you're thinking about the type of tomato, you're thinking indeterminate versus determinate. And determinate means a, a determinate plant is designed to grow to a specific height. It produces all of its fruit pretty much at one time and then it's done. Whereas an indeterminate like these will grow and grow and grow and grow until the frost kills it. So depending on when you guys get cold weather is how long your plant will grow. So it's not uncommon for these plants to produce, you know, from May, April maybe, all the way until December. In a, in a relatively frost-free area. Um, another thing you could be talking about with type of tomato would be a hybrid or heirloom. Now, a hybrid tomato, a lot of people think hear hybrid and they think all of a sudden GMO. And that's not necessarily the case. Most of the time it isn't the case with tomatoes. Uh, I could produce a hybrid right here in my own garden by selecting two different, spe uh, two different types of tomatoes that have good qualities and pollinating them with each other and then saving those seeds and not letting anything else pollinate it. Um, a hybrid tomato, you're, you're gonna see a lot of hybrid tomatoes at your garden center, for instance. And those tomatoes, and we'll get into more of this on a seed saving video that we'll be doing, but those tomatoes are not, if you save the seeds from those tomatoes and plant them next year, you're not necessarily gonna get the same thing. In fact, you probably won't where heirlooms are considered open pollinated. And if you see any seeds that say open pollinated, that means that you're gonna be able to save those seeds and put them in the ground next year and they're probably gonna grow the same plant. Heirlooms have stories, they've been passed down for generations and still they're coming true from the seed. Okay, the second mistake that you might have made already, hopefully not if you've watched some of my other videos, is uh, planting in too much shade. Now the only type of tomato that will grow in some shade is cherry tomatoes, possibly currants, but, but cherry tomatoes, they'll take some shade. Uh, any other tomato that you're gr gonna grow, you want at least six hours of sun, and the more sun you can give them, the better, the sweeter they're gonna be. We talked about that on our tomato sweetness video. Uh, so you want, you know, six to eight hours is ideal. If you can give them more than that, great. Now, along the same lines, uh, the third mistake is planting incorrectly. And there's a couple of things here. First of all, if you watch my tomato planting video, I'm going to link all these videos down in the description so you can watch them again. Uh, but in planting tomatoes, you want to plant them deep. You don't want to plant them right on top of the soil like any other plant because the deeper you plant them, the more roots they will produce along their stem. Now, if you've already planted your tomato and you didn't plant it deep, you can get some uh, a bag of maybe organic potting mix and pile a mound up as, as high as you can get it, maybe up to a foot or at least a half a foot around that tomato and keep that moist when you're watering. And that will uh, help tomatoes, the tomatoes start to grow, growing new roots even right now. Now, along the same lines with planting, you might make the mistake of not giving the plant the nutrients it needs to get off to a good start and to help feed it throughout the season. 
Um, one of the biggest things that the tomato needs for fruiting and flowering is phosphorus. That's the middle number on a bag of fertilizer. And so if you watched my planting video, we added that in the form of the Neptune's Harvest crab and lobster shell. And that's gonna give a nice slow release of phosphorus throughout the, uh, throughout the season. Phosphorus does not move very well through the soil, so it's important that you do that at planting time. And once again, if you didn't, it's not too late. If you do the whole mound up thing, like I just said, mix some of that phosphorus in there. You can use the crab and lobster, I'll link that below. You can use bone meal, uh, but that is important for tomato production. Now, while we're talking about fertilizing, um, a lot of people make the mistake of fertilizing too much. And that's usually in the form of nitrogen. That's the first number on a tomato or on a fertilizer bag. So the more nitrogen you give it, the more leafy growth you're going to get. And that's the plant just putting its effort into making a big plant. We don't want that. We want the fruit. I don't know the last time you ate a tomato leaf, but I'm not going to do it. It's probably nasty. That's why I use the um, Neptune's Harvest tomato and veg formula. It's got a very low amount of nitrogen, a, a two is the number on there, and a four for the phosphorus. So it's got low nitrogen, high phosphorus, exactly what these tomatoes are looking for. Now, when you're planting your tomatoes, you want to make sure you provide proper spacing. That could be another issue. Uh, if you are pruning your tomatoes into cordons like this, and I'll have that video linked down below, and we'll talk about it when we get to pruning, uh, you, can, you can get away with having your tomatoes about 12 to 15 inches apart because you're taking off the leaves as they grow. So it gives them space, gives them room for airflow. Uh, if you're growing determinate types, two feet would be a great spacing for that. Or if you're not gonna be cutting off the suckers, two feet is a good a rule of thumb there as well. Now with current tomatoes, like we saw at Tammy's last week, uh, four feet spacing might be too little. So it does depend on the variety and that's why you need to know the variety uh, or the type of tomato you're growing. Okay, so the next mistake is not providing the proper support. Um, I think probably the most popular way to support a tomato is those cheap tomato cages at the garden center. And unfortunately, that's not a good way to support a tomato. Possibly a determinate type if they're strong, but those end up falling apart after a season. And so you wanna make sure if you're gonna get those, get the biggest ones you can find and the sturdiest ones. You can actually try to bend them around and see if they bend easy or break apart. So with a determinate or dwarf variety, those might be good. But with an indeterminate, I mean, that's seriously not going to handle it after its you know first month of growth. And you could have up to six months. So um, I'm not gonna go into all of this right here because it's just too difficult to do, but I have a nice visual presentation on a video um, on how I grow my tomatoes up these string supports. It's super easy, super cheap, and you can fit more tomatoes in a small amount of space. So I'm gonna link that video um, down in the description. So I'm trying not to make this video very long because some of this is recap and some of it is new. So I'm going to try to focus more on the new that I haven't discussed in other videos. And if I've discussed it, I'm going to link you right to that spot where you can get 100% more information that I could just give right now, unless we turn this into an hour long video and who wants to sit through that. So that brings us to our next mistake that you might make, and that is not pruning your tomatoes. Now I'm growing these in cordons. And that I feel is the best way to do it. And in order to do this, you need to prune the suckers out. And everywhere you see a leaf come out of the stem, you're gonna see, it's gonna be an armpit. And right in the, the join there, there's gonna be another little sprout coming out. And that's gonna make pretty much a whole new tomato plant that gives less fruit than the rest, but it takes that energy away. So we're gonna pinch those out. Everywhere we see one, all the way up, everywhere a leaf comes out, in that elbow or that, that elbow or armpit, whatever you want to call it, there's going to be a new growth coming and just pinch those out all the way up. And that's going to let the tomato focus on the real production, which is right along the main stem. It's also imperative that you prune your tomatoes if you live in a humid climate. We don't, but I still prune for the other reasons. But if you live in a humid climate, you need to get airflow through your tomatoes. And you can see, I can stick my arm right through to the other side and actually see all the way through to the other side because I'm pruning my tomatoes. 
which reduces moisture, which reduces um, pathogens and bacteria that are gonna get on the leaves and cause disease and could possibly kill your plant. So the last thing I wanna touch on for pruning is, if you notice, I do have, can you see this? Some browning leaves, some yellowing leaves. These aren't diseased, they're just old. But I go ahead and I clip those off as well. As they, as they turn yellow, if I see any issues at all, I clip those off. It not only helps with the airflow, but old leaves, yellow leaves, are, are the first ones that are gonna be attacked by pests and disease. So it just lessens that, uh, that issue, and it also gets them further from the ground so that you don't have the splashback. Now, that brings us naturally to the next mistake, and that is improper watering. Now, going off of what we just said, you do not want to water your tomato leaves because that is going to produce a wet environment that gives a lot of breeding ground for bacteria. So always water your tomatoes from below. If you're gonna get a drip system installed, that is the number one way that I would recommend. I have a video on installing drip, I will link below. Now, if you use a hose, you wanna make sure that you water below, but you also don't want splashback. If you put the hose down and it splashes up from the soil and gets on the leaves, you're now introducing pathogens from the soil onto the leaf and the leaf is wet. So that's gonna be even worse. So uh, if you are watering with a hose, be very careful, have it on low. And I would recommend putting down mulch so that you have a barrier between the soil pathogens and the plant. So if you do get splashed back off of mulch, it's not gonna be the same detrimental, uh, have the same detrimental effect that it would straight off of the soil. Continuing on with watering, mulch helps with watering because it keeps the soil moisture more even. It does not allow for as much evaporation quickly. Uh, so any type of mulch that you wanna put, wood chips, wood shavings, uh, lawn clippings, dead leaves, straw. Uh, I use actually just homemade compost. I just put a couple of inches on there at the beginning of the season. Not only does it help keep the moisture in, but as it breaks down further, it will feed the plants and feed the soil. So in all of my videos that I talk about watering, I talk about the finger method. You stick your finger two inches to three inches into the soil. And if you feel moisture, don't water. They're a-okay. The top one or two inches might be dry. And that just is because the, the sun's hitting that, but it doesn't mean they need water. If you overwater a tomato, you're gonna have the blossoms start to fall off. So if you have, uh, if you don't have hot weather and the blossoms are falling off, it's probably because they're overwatered. You also don't wanna let them go bone dry. If you let them go bone dry, you're gonna get blossom end rot. I've actually got it out front on my um, San Marzano tomatoes because in that garden area, I have not yet installed drip because I have to go under the driveway, which is gonna be a pain, but I have to do it. But I haven't installed drip there yet, and I had to take away the hose from the front yard because on the other side of the driveway, I put in drip and I didn't need the hose. So I, I had a whole issue with the plants drying out too much, and I have blossom and rotto out there. So keep your plants evenly moist, and you won't have blossom end rot, and you won't have fruit cracking. Fruit cracking occurs when there's been a dry period and the plants kind of just, sat, or the, the tomatoes kind of just sat there. And then all of a sudden you watered a whole bunch and they sucked up as much water as they could and just busted right through their skins. And so you get fruit cracking, which doesn't mean the tomato's inedible. Um, you just want to cut those pieces off that are cracked because mold and things can develop in there and probably wouldn't be the best to eat. Now, another reason that the flowers might fall off is if it's getting too hot. Any weather that gets into the 90s for several days in a row the, the flowers are gonna drop off because the plant wants to conserve its energy into ripening the fruit that are already on there and not creating new fruit. So it just drops the flowers. So to help with that, make sure the plants are watered and you put some, some shade cloth over the plants until that heat wave goes away. Now, if you live in a place that has summers that are just 90 degrees for a month or two at a time, keep your plants healthy. And then when the weather cools off, they'll start producing again. Brings us to our next mistake of not hand pollinating. Now I think in the past, this was probably a non-issue, but now we have so 
few pollinators that come to our gardens. You know, the bees are really being decimated throughout the country and probably the world. I've heard from a lot of you in different countries who say, yes, there are less and less bees every year visiting your garden. And it's sad and it's scary and I really hope things turn around. And us as gardeners are on the front lines by not using pesticides and herbicides, killing everything in our yard. Let's do it organically so we can at least start building back our bee populations in our neighborhoods. There's not a lot we can do to control big ag and they're gonna keep using the cheapest, most effective methods and that is poisons. So let's at least do our part as home gardeners. But there are less bees and so that means less pollination. So we need to become the bee for now. And that means doing a few different things. Hand pollinating by hitting the plant, knocking the cage, whatever you're growing it on. The plants on tomatoes are perfect plants, meaning they have a male and female part in the same flower, very close together. So just a simple vibration will do it. Um, you can use a paintbrush, which I showed you on a pollination video. You can use a electric toothbrush to cause the vibration, which I showed you on that same video, but we need to do it. Otherwise the flowers are gonna fall off and if they're not pollinated and that's just, that's the way it is. Okay, the last mistake you might be making is not paying attention to your plants and what they are trying to tell you. Now, here I'm talking about pests and disease. If you visit your plants often, daily, um, you're gonna notice if there's any type of black spots, uh, if there's any type of something eating or maybe some droppings from a tomato hornworm, and you'll be able to get on top of that quickly. Now I have a whole video on tomato pests and disease that you guys have really loved, so I'll link that down below. It's gonna go through the different pests, how to spot them, and how to take care of them once you have them or prevent them. But for many reasons, you wanna visit your plants. I mean, we love our plants, right? They're our kids. You're going to notice the pests and disease. You're going to notice pollination issues. You're going to notice um, whether they're wilting, whether they're getting leaf curl, which I have another video on. Uh, it's super important to visit your plants all the time because that's the only way you're going to know if something's wrong and get on top of it quickly. It's kind of like your, your, your yearly checkup at the doctor. You, you can get on something quickly and you don't, don't let it fester and progress without you even knowing it's there. Okay, so that's it. 10 mistakes that you will never make again. I hope you enjoyed it. If you learned something, please give the video a thumbs up. If you're not subscribed already, subscribe. And I will see you on Friday.